Welcome to Current Affairs at Copenhagen Suborbitals. What's happening right now in the Amateur Rocket Project, with the goal of launching a human being into space and bringing him safely back to Earth? Hosted by Thomas Peterson. Hi all, and welcome to another video from our workshop. Today we'll talk a bit more about the DPR section, and first we'll have Fleming explaining a bit on how it works. So here it is, uh, next to one, after a very tough uh, day at the office, it is uh, resting here, while next to two is being built around us. And the most obvious difference from the next to one to the next to two rocket is the dynamic pressure regulation or DPR system. So I would like to tell you a little about what's that's, uh, what that's all about. Now, the background is that a fundamental uh, challenge of running a rocket engine is that you need to force fuel into it. It's not like a car engine which has intake valves so that it can actually suck in fuel and then close that valve before combustion. The uh, rocket engine has continuous combustion and to get a certain thrust you need a certain chamber pressure and whatever that is you need to push the fuel in, deliver it at a higher pressure than that to get it in there. And uh, next to one here, like all previous uh, Copenhagen Suborbitals rockets, does this by what is known as a pressure blowdown system. And the way that works is you build uh, an oversized fuel tank so that after filling in the fuel there is a, a volume of uh, gas above the fuel and then by pressurizing that gas uh, you can use it to push out the fuel. Now. <clears throat> that system has the advantage of probably being uh, the simplest and most reliable uh, pressure feed system, um, but it also has some disadvantages. And uh, an obvious one is that now you need to build larger fuel tanks, oversized uh, fuel tanks, which is a mass penalty. And, um, and uh, also, as soon as fuel starts leaving the tank, this uh, gas ullage will expand, and that causes it to lose pressure. So. Uh, if you add just a small ullage volume at top, then as fuel leaves, it will quickly become twice uh, as large and three times and four times as large. That means fuel pressure will drop rapidly and then um, engine uh, combustion pre pressure will drop, which causes you to lose thrust. So now basically you need to add not a small but a very significant uh, extra amount of uh, fuel tank volume so that you can have a large gas ullage to prevent your engine from running out of breath quickly after launch. And whatever you do, it's always a trade-off because um, even a large ullage will expand, pressure will drop. At some point, it will have expanded to twice its size during the burn and uh, that means fuel pressure will actually be a little less than half. So. Um, you cannot keep your rocket engine running uh, close to anywhere close to its uh, optimal operating point um, for more than uh, a short fraction of the burn. So you can tolerate that for a small rocket like this, but it's, it's not a viable future for the speaker rocket in uh, Copenhagen's orbitals, for instance. So we know we need to uh, develop and gain experience with a technology that can simply uh, develop uh, fuel pressure in a more consistent fashion. And the next step up from pressure blowdown is uh, dynamic pressure regulation or DPR which is uh, added to uh, next to 2 The way that works is um, we add a new high pressure uh, ullage gas uh, tank to the rocket. It's a small high pressure tank containing only gas at the liftoff and then by controlling a flow of gas from that and into the ullages of the fuel tanks, we can actively uh, control and maintain the fuel tank pressure even though the ullages are expanding. Now, uh, this has uh, some advantages and uh, one is that you no longer have this trade-off with ullage volume. You can uh, do with just a small ullage volume as long as your control system keeps up, it can uh, maintain fuel pressure uh, without a large overhead in fuel tank size. Also, and maybe more importantly, by maintaining the fuel feed pressure, you can keep your uh, rocket engine close to its uh, optimum operating point during not a minority, but the majority of the burn. 
So uh, this is what we do for uh, Nexo 2 and DPR is uh, actually something we have experience with because we have been using it for quite a while on our test stand and most recently for the test of the uh, flight engine for, uh, for Nexo 2. Now uh, we need to take this technology from the static test stand and into the rocket and whenever you do that uh, it, needs to, uh, it, it needs to fly and that causes additional complexity. Uh, one thing is that on the test stand mass is not an issue. So uh, for the high pressure gas tanks, we, we basically just use scuba diving tanks. But the problem is that uh, once they are out of the sea, they're actually quite heavy. So adding that to a rocket would be a quite significant mass penalty. So instead we have purchased a, a fancy carbon ore wrapped uh, high pressure tank, which holds uh, 300 bars and it is only 12 kilograms. <coughs> also, uh, there's, also, uh, there's always a fundamental uh, difference between fuel pressures in static testing and in flight, and that is something we need to account for. That is because inside a fuel tank, the fuel pressure is always higher towards the bottom than at the top, and it's simply because of the effect of gravity on the tank. This is the same thing that causes uh, pressure to be high in the sea at, at large depth. But in the sea, and in fuel tanks, in static test, this effect is constant because it is simply caused by the constant effect of gravity on the fuel. But in flight, it's different because in addition to gravity, there is uh, acceleration and acceleration has kind of the same effect. So it's now the combination of um, gravity and acceleration that causes hydrostatic pressure in the tanks. And that means that our control system for DPR controlling the amount of uh, gas flow from this high pressure tank and into the fuel tanks, uh, which will be implemented in the Nexo 2 engine control unit. It will um, control fuel pressure by adding this gas in at uh, the top of the tanks at one pressure, but controlling the pressure at the uh, inlet ports of the, um, of the engine where uh, the pressure is actually larger. So, uh, the software has to account for that and as you can imagine it's also kind of a circular argument because um, if you have more acceleration then you get a higher uh, hydrostatic pressure so fuel pressure then increases chamber pressure then increases so thrust increases producing yet more acceleration and uh, these are the things that uh, we will account for and are working on now um, and uh, is the, uh, maybe the biggest uh, separate uh, development step for Nexo 2. Three, two, one. So Scott, today we have you with us in, the, in our little interim studio here. So what, uh, what is your task around CS? Yeah, my main job is electronics and radio communication. So I've do a lot of the software programming for various components in the rockets, and I've designed most of the radio systems that we're using for telemetry and telecommand. Yeah, and so that's not only for the rocket, we're also involved in the, so the data link back to Copenhagen for streaming and... Yes, and that's that on top of it. Yes. All right, so Scott, now we, we heard Fleming talk about how, uh, how the DPR section works and how it, it makes the engine burn at full combustion pressure all along. So let's talk a bit about the, the pieces on the rocket that makes this happen. So the first box that we have here, so this is the uh, engine controller. It's actually from, uh, from the Nexo 1 rocket. So as you can see, it has a, a few, uh, it's a bit damaged uh, because it, it landed hard on Nexo 1. But the one on Nexo 2 will be more or less identical to, to this engine controller, I presume. Yeah, the Nexo 2 one is basically the same hardware. There's a little difference in some of the interfaces uh, change in number of sensors and a couple of extra outputs on Nexo 2 for the DPR system. But besides that, it's the same piece of hardware. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so when, when I look in, uh, in this box, it has uh, some, uh, some uh, cable connections and then it has two prints. So what, what do we have on these prints? What do they do? Yeah, the, the bottom PCB is a pretty much a generic microcontroller that we've developed. And the top one is a interface board that interfaces to the various uh, specific sensors we're using on this engine. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I mean, what the engine controller does, it it uh, it will start up the engine, and then it will operate all the valves, 
and it will it takes uh, chamber pressures uh, well pressures from the, the whole system and uh, and make sure that uh, that the engine is running normally right yes uh, it's connected to a number of uh, pressure sensors throughout the whole rocket and it controls all the valves based on a, a preset program that's loaded in the software mm-hmm. so Scott how many sensors do we actually have on the next two rocket Yeah, the total system is about 20 sensors, uh, some of them pressure sensors, some of them temperature sensors, and a couple of position sensors uh, for the uh, main valves. Okay, and so uh, <clears throat> so obviously one of the most important sensors is the uh, pressure sensor in the in the combustion chamber. So that uh, measures if we're at n- uh, normal, normal uh, pressure. But it also provides input for the uh, for the guidance system or the jet vane system. The guidance system needs the chamber pressure because the chamber pressure is equal to the amount of thrust generated by the engine. And the amount of thrust on the engine is, then part of that is deflected by the uh, by the jet vanes. And as such, the amount of force that is deflected depends on the thrust, which depends, which can be measured from the chamber pressure. Yeah, exactly. So we use the uh, chamber pressure as an input parameter to the loop that controls the uh, the jet mains. Yes. Yeah. Right. And so on uh, Nexus 2, one of the main uh, differences between Nexus 1 and 2 is this DPR system that keeps the uh, combustion chamber high. It actually keeps the uh, the pressure uh, high in the co- uh, propellant tanks. Right. And so in order to do that, we have the DPR system and the DPR system just consists of uh, well it consists of a helium tank and a, a set of valves. So, uh, so Scott, uh, I brought a, a couple of the of the valves that we're using, and uh, so can you uh, tell us where where this one is used in the system? Yeah, this one is the first valve for the high pressure gas. So, high pressure gas has to go through this one before it actually gets down to the second valve, which is this one, because this valve can do the regulation of pressure of uh, the gas flow, whereas this one is just an on-off valve. The reason we need both of them is that the Uh, this one can't actually close completely. It's just a little bit open always. Mm-hmm. Uh, so to avoid getting uh, the high pressure gas into the system too early, we actually need an extra one to shut it off completely. Yeah. And so uh, this valve is actually uh, it's actually a hydraulics valve. So we're using it completely out of spec of what it's designed to do. And if we open it up, we can see a bit of how it works. So uh, I don't know if, uh, if the camera can see this, but so we have uh, a set of or- uh, orifices down here, and then we have a, uh, a piston that can move up and down and, uh, and reveal uh, a number of these uh, holes that will then let uh, gas through uh, this section of the of yes. the seating. All right. All right. So Scott, this is the uh, engine controller from Nexu One, and uh, it has a bit of damage. It uh, so first of all, it's it's bent a little bit. So it's obviously because Nexus One landed hard. Nexus One landed very hard, and it got pretty deep into the ocean. So the pressure from the ocean actually deformed the top plate on it. The pressure was actually so high that it managed to push out some of the plastic connectors. Uh, they were pushed out of the metal. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you also see the, uh, the the cover plate here is uh, is bent several millimeters down. Yeah, due to the uh, similarly the pressure in the ocean. Yes, when the next one dove into the ocean, right? So, but this uh, Indian controller, it's uh, it, it's not uh, it's not so big. If we, if we compare it to the test stand, we have a, a electronics rack about this size, right? Yes. Which I presume houses more or less the same, or it pretty much houses the same electronics. So there's just more space for cables. So yeah. this is uh, I mean, this is the, the flight optimized version of yes of the the big rack that we have on the on the test stand, right? Yes. Yeah. So Scott, when I look in the uh, engine controller box here, I see two prints. Could you tell a bit about what uh, what we have here? Yeah, let me just get them out of the box. So it contains two PCBs. The bottom one is a generic engine control. It is a generic microcontroller board, and the top one is a interface board that interfaces to the particular sensors we have on uh, the uh, Nature One rocket. Mm-hmm. Okay, and so that means the, the, the bottom card is, is where the CPU yes. is actually sitting. And so is that the card that is uh, in family with the Arduino? Yes, that's a Arduino clone. 
Okay. So this is the uh, what we call the CS Duino. Yes. Because it's a, it's a clone of the Arduino. Yeah. Yeah. And so this is developed uh, in house. Yes. By uh, by mainly you or mainly Bolt. Okay. Right. So the uh, so the board is, is primarily made by Bolt, but you're in charge of, of programming it. Yes. All the software is written by me on this board. So Scott, when uh, when we launch the rocket, for instance, when we launched next year one, we had a uh, console on Vostok where I pushed a button that started a, uh, a sixty second uh, timer. And then what happens when, when I press that button and, and when does this one start doing stuff? Yeah, that button sends a signal to this engine controller which starts the actual countdown loop. Uh, that's a pre-programmed sequence of events that we've built into the system. And it will, at the right time, uh, fire the ignition system. Uh, it will open the valves when appropriate. It detects if the chamber pressure is sufficient for going into main stage. And finally, it closes all the valves after the burn again. Mm -hmm. And it will also uh, uh, shut the engine off again if, if we don't uh, have a proper main stage yes. combustion, right? If it doesn't reach the proper main stage pressure in, in a given time, it will actually close the engine and close the valves and shut down the engine immediately. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's a, a safeguard uh, against uh, launching with a engine that doesn't run. Yes. As it's supposed to, yeah. So, Scott, uh, once we push the button, everything more or less runs automatically. Yes. When we, when we fly. So, how about on the test stand? Um, what, what's the sequence on the test stand? The sequence is quite similar, but it's, it has a few extra steps in it that are done manually, actually. Uh, for instance, the perch of the engine we do after the burn on the test stand, that's something we do manually. Yeah, and that's when you see that all the... Uh, the ethanol that's are in the in the pipes that it's just pushed out into a gigantic flame. Yes. After the engine. Yeah. In the flight version, we don't really need to do that because we run the the engine until the tanks are empty, so it's purged automatically. Yeah, it's simply purged with the helium that's yes. in the fuel tank. Yeah. Right. So, uh, but uh, next to two, it still has a purging system. It has a purging system, but that's designed for p only for purge if we have a uh, misfire. So basically, if we have started the engine and decided to abort, then we have a lot of alcohol in the engine that we want to get rid of before we approach the, uh, the platform again. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so I guess this is uh, mostly an automatic abort if we don't sustain or if we don't achieve a combustion chamber higher than the threshold. Yes. Then the, the system will automatically abort yes. and purge the, uh, the fuel lines. Yeah. Yes. So Scott, thanks for visiting our studio today. Okay. So that was a bit about uh, still the DPR system, uh, but also the uh, engine controller that will be flying on Nexus 2. For further information about Copenhagen Suborbitals and our mission, please go to our YouTube channel as well as our homepage www.corpsart.com. As we're funded entirely by sponsors and donors, we need the support of our many fans to reach our goal of manned amateur spaceflight. You can support us by contributing through the support page. <laughs>